Hi, I'm Stephanie and this is my home, the 16th century Chateau de Lalande. Lalande was owned for hundreds of years by a family of marquises who were at the heart of French royal life. One of them even had the honour of being sent by King Louis XV to greet Marie Antoinette on her arrival in France. But, far from being a stuffy museum, this chateau is a living home. I live here all the time and I'm regularly joined by my mother, my family, my friends and wonderful volunteers from all over the world who help me to lovingly restore this historic home. Welcome to La Lande, a chateau filled with life, love and laughter. Welcome to Sundays at the Chateau, where today I would like to continue sharing more of the rich cultural and artistic heritage of this region of France. We live only an hour away from Limoges, and I would love to tell you more about the Porcelaine de Limoges. I've decided to start by talking about the company Bernardo, not only because they are the ones that are most represented in the collections here at the Chateau, but also because by looking at the history of Bernardo, you can learn a lot about the designs of Limoges porcelain right from its beginnings in the 18th century to incredibly contemporary designs made today. So recently, Oliver, Scottman and I went to do a tour of the factory in Bernardo and I'd love to take you with us. We're going to go and discover how the porcelain's been made here for hundreds of years. Although these buildings look modern, as soon as we step inside you can see that this is an ancient building and this is where all of the porcelain of Bernardo was made until 1991 and all of the decoration by hand still happens here. This part is absolutely fascinating to me because for many centuries the art of porcelain was a complete mystery to people in Europe and eventually it was discovered that the Chinese made this precious white gold using kaolin and it's called kaolin because it was from the province of kaolin in china and in the 18th century it was discovered that there was kaolin here in limoges a shepherdess said that she found this lovely white earth that she used to use to make her clothes whiter when she was washing them and as soon as this was found the porcelain industry could be born here in limoges to make porcelain you need 50 percent of this which is used in a powdered form and it's so soft that it's used a lot in cosmetics and it's this that geishas used on their face to make their faces white. I won't do it right now though, it's pretty tempting. <laughs> and that is mixed with 25% of feldspar, which is again used in a powdered form and this is a type of granite which is found in this area as well and it's what gives strength to the porcelain and to that I think the bit that I find most exciting quartz is added and this is what gives the brilliance to porcelain 25% is this which again is found in this area and Limoges also has a lot of forest so it had all of the wood that it needed to be able to do the production here to fire all of the porcelain and it also has a lot of rivers with very pure water so everything that was needed was right here in this city. This is the huge drying room that was used unbelievably until 1991 and this is where the porcelain dries it must be completely dry before it has its first firing so after being molded the pieces would be placed on these planks and imagine how scary it must be to try and get them into the right place. And then after they dried, and they get whiter and whiter as they dry, they would then be taken for their very first firing. Look at that cushion that? effect. That? That's amazing. That's amazing, I don't know. Maybe they must put sit. Your beautiful gold mugs on in the morning. Oh, imagine that next to me in bed first thing. I love it. Beautiful, These shapes it? are spectacular. I just, I just don't know how. I, I'm asking a practical question, but how do they get this down? People take one end and someone takes the other end and they have to walk them off. Can you imagine? Don't trip me up. How much do you think it would cost if I fell on top of the wall? I don't want to find out. The moulds for the porcelain are made by starting off with a block of plaster cutting it into the shape that you want, then drawing in pencil on it, and finally meticulously engraving the design onto the plaster. From that, a mould can be made into which resin is poured, and that resin form is used to create all of the moulds from then on. 
Because extraordinarily, even today, each mould is only used 40 times before it needs to be remade. The liquid mixture of kaolin, feldspath and quartz is then added to the mould. Déverse le surplus. Et là, la magie a opéré. Et après le séchage, ça devient beaucoup plus blanc. Une fois que ça a séché, voilà, on a des bavures. Notamment, apparaissent les coutures. On a besoin d'ébarber, qu'on appelle aussi le finissage. C'est encore fait aujourd'hui à la main. Pour rendre la pièce homogène. It's amazing to see so many moulds piled up waiting to make beautiful objects to be fired. In the past that was done in this extraordinary oven, the first tunnel oven to be created in France in the mid-50s. It was powered by natural gas. Once the pieces have been moulded and dried and have had their first firing, they're ready for glazing. Alors, qu'est-ce que c'est les mâles C'est du kaolin, du quartz et du feldspath, mais dans des proportions différentes. Ah ouais. Mais il y a bien moins de kaolin et beaucoup plus de quartz, de quartz. parce que c'est le quartz qui rend cet aspect brillant et brillant. Ah ouais. C'est vraiment un savoir-faire ancestral, c'est un coup de main à avoir, puisqu'on soutient les objets sur le dessous, sur la couture ici, puisqu'on ne veut pas laisser de traces de doigts. Il faudra m'excuser, moi je ne suis pas un émailleur professionnel et je vais vous montrer justement ce qu'il ne faut pas faire. Ce que vous allez voir ici, ma trace de doigt. Je plonge mon assiette à l'intérieur. Je fais répandre les mailles. Et là, allez-y, monsieur. Vous wow. pouvez toucher. You can touch it now, touch it. It's already dry. And there's the mark of his finger showing you just how skilled glazers have to be to get this right. Once glazed, the piece is fired again, and that's when it takes on this brilliant, shiny quality. Ici, donc, on l'a coulé, on l'a découlé en attendant qu'elle sèche. On a eu la première cuisson, 980 degrés. Celle-ci, on l'a trempée dans le bain des mailles. Deuxième cuisson, 1400 degrés. Et là, voilà le résultat. Pensez que quotidiennement, par jour, on a 25% de défauts, 25% de rebuts. Alors, qu'est-ce que c'est ces défauts on a des défauts visuels qui sont ces petits grains noirs très légers ici. Des impuretés qui vont éclater dans le four et généralement c'est incrusté, on ne peut pas les enlever. La porcelaine est très sonore. Cette pièce-là, elle est parfaite. Alors que celle-là, qui a l'air parfaite, elle a un défaut. Oh. Oh. Il y a une fêlure ici, très légère. Once they've made sure everything is perfect, the porcelain can then be decorated. These are the transfers that are used, one transfer per plate. And here you can see the ancient transfers. My goodness, that peacock plate must have been beautiful. And once the colors and the rich patterns are on the plate, the finishing touch is to apply the gold band around the exterior by hand. Aujourd'hui, c'est le même principe, c'est fait à la main, sauf qu'ils ont une pédale qui fait tourner le tourniquet, okay. et ensuite, ils n'ont plus qu'à déposer à la main. An extraordinary 25% of all pieces are deemed imperfect, not good enough to sell at the end of the production process. So what happens to that 25% Well, they come here to Bernardo's only factory shop in the world. How lucky am I and in the whole factory shop, this little area behind me is my favorite because it's here that they bring the pieces from the Ancienne Manufacture Royale de Limoges. All of the historic pieces are in this little corner of the factory shop. And this is where I find my treasures. So, Steph, you told me you had, quote, one or two pieces <laughs> of Bernardo, and it seems you've got a little bit more than one or two, but you've been busy, haven't you? It's a collection, Oliver. It's not <laughs> extravagant if it counts as a collection. I love it. I mean, they are really pretty, really pretty. I'll tell you all about the different styles that we've got here, uh, because I put them in a sort of historical order. Ah, yeah, you see I've, what I did there? I've been wondering what you've been doing, sort of squirreling away on the table. <laughs> yeah, uh, we start with the very first plate. In 1986, Bernardo bought the Ancienne Manufacture Royale de Limoges and they have the right to reproduce many of the ancient royal designs made at Limoges and made in Sèvres and in other royal manufactories. And that's why at Bernardo today you can still buy incredible pieces from historic collections that can be found in museums all around the world today. 
This was the first design made on hard paste porcelain by the Manufacture de Limoges in 1774. And on the back, they've put CD. They were the initials of the Comte d'Artois, who was the grandson of Louis XV, the brother of Louis XVI, and he himself, after the restoration of the monarchy, became King Charles X in France. But when he was only 16 years old, he was put in charge of this porcelain manufactory. Louis XV's mistress, Madame de Pompadour, loved porcelain. They had moved the Sèvres factory to be near her palace, and they were producing beautiful pieces of soft paste porcelain there in Sèvres. But he also wanted to create porcelain in Limoges, so he sent his grandson to oversee the factory. The design is still very much based on the designs at Sèvres. Sèvres were using a soft paste porcelain, which is very hard to work with and gets quite a lot of faults. So at the time, they tended to put very loose little bouquets of flowers or individual flowers so that they could just place them on the defects after the firing. And it was only once the hard paste porcelain had really been perfected in Limoges in later years that they were able to make very ordered symmetrical designs. So this is an example of those early, loose, free-flowing designs. I like these very much. This one dates from just a few years later in 1782. And this was designed in Sèvres for Marie Antoinette for her home in Le Petit Trianon in Versailles. Marie Antoinette's favourite wildflowers were cornflowers, but she also loved pearls. So this is this perfect mixture of the refinement of the French court that's seen in the pearls, but also the loose, natural, more rustic style of living that was very famous after the philosophy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and which Marie Antoinette loved, as seen in the wildflowers mixed in. And I just think it's incredible to have a plate here, to be able to buy a plate today, and you can eat off something that is exactly the same thing that Marie Antoinette ate from back in the 18th century and have the same experience that she had whilst having your, what, bacon and eggs in the morning, Ollie? <laughs> <laughs> no, much more refined. <laughs> the year 1782 was actually a very good year for cornflowers in porcelain because this plate also dates from 1782. This one wasn't ordered by Marie Antoinette. It was ordered by her husband, Louis XVI. This was ordered for the king's officers, those who were responsible for serving the wine and the fruits at the table. So it's called le gobelet du roi. And again, it has cornflowers and myrtle leaves and a rose in the middle. It's the same idea of very naturalistic decor. In 1783, Louis XVI wanted a new hunting lodge at Rambouillet, but he needed to persuade Marie Antoinette that there was something in it for her. You see, she was very much into living in the countryside like a dairy maid. So he made a special dairy for her at Rambouillet. And they asked Sèvres to design specific porcelain for the dairy so that when she was playing at being a milkmaid, she could really drink the milk in style. Some of the cups had little cows on them because of cow's milk. But this is by far the best. You can see it's resting on a tripod of goats. Oh, so that lifts up? It lifts up. Gosh, you get, do you dare do it? But when you lift it up, what do you get? Are you waiting for this? Uh, I'm worried. <gasps> I'm very worried. human breast. This was Marie Antoinette's cup at Rambouillet so that she could drink milk just... from possibly one of humans' favourite ways of getting it. And this was made by Sèvres originally, yeah. and this is an exact reproduction of it, which would set you back 1,257. It's just the colour of it. Well, I'm, I'm cupping it now. So, Stephanie, I'm not being funny, but can you imagine the shock if you had a tea party for a refined tea party at home? <laughs> so the idea is just to give one person that cup. <laughs> yes, and they rest, don't know. And the rest of them, you could get a plain <laughs> version. Get and sit them opposite their yeah. mother-in-law. Yeah. That'd be so funny. The rest of it, you get the same thing, but you swap it out for a plain... Oh. What are you laughing at? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so which is your favourite, Oliver? I think you know me well enough to be able to guess. So, mm -hmm. as a little hint, it's got a little bit of gold in it. You know how I like a bit of gold. You love a bit of bling. Or... And mm -hmm. um, there's a pair, which I think narrows it down. It narrows it down completely. It can't be this one. We've already talked about that. Therefore, the only other pair we have are from the Botanique set. Is it these? Yeah. 
And I particularly love, I mean, I love the pink, but I particularly love the blue. I just think the contrast with the blue and the gold is just absolutely stunning. Well, you have excellent taste because this is the Botanique service that was ordered from Sèvres secretly in 1829 by William II of Hesse. He wanted a set for 60 people that was over 500 pieces and it took Sèvres over two years to make that dinner service. Why was it secret? I actually don't know why he wanted it to be kept a secret, but he ordered it under a fake name, Monsieur Schaumburg. Um, but in fact, it was William II of Hesse who ordered it. Maybe he didn't want people knowing how much he was spending on porcelain. Yeah, We've all been there. Money. Money. <laughs> I sometimes pretend it was someone else who got things from my mother. <laughs> I tell her that, oh wait, I found it in the back of the cupboard. <laughs> Maybe William II of Hesse was doing the same thing. I suspect he probably was. <laughs> Beautiful though. And each piece had a different flower around it, so I just have two. But every single piece had another flower, another type of flower, and they were all based on the paintings of Rodoutier, who made stunning drawings of flowers, especially a lot of beautiful roses. Okay, so are you collecting this? Well, I can't afford to go to Bernard d'Or and buy an entire service like this. It would be impossible. And I can't go to the second shop and buy an entire service because they never have a whole service of one thing available. So what I decided to do is to go in and get one plate in each of the historic services. And I'm making a mismatched set. And that way we can just mix and match. And when people come to dinner, the wonderful thing is that every plate will have a story behind it. And I think that adds to the fun of a dinner. I love that. It's a really good idea. So I'd started this project and then I got incredibly lucky one day because I found this entire Bernard d'Or service wow. in a local charity shop. Where? I think I paid Yes, near, nearby in Châteauroux and I paid a hundred euros for the entire set. Gosh, that's a good good deal. Yes, it's got four serving platters, the terrine and many plates and bowls. And what's the date of this one? This one is much later. This is the Regence pattern. But you can see that it's harking back to that yeah, very original, first yeah. plate. The idea of these naturalistic little bouquets and flowers. Can I put it next to it? Absolutely. It looks, yeah, it's got that same feel, hasn't it? But this one dates from sometime, probably just before 1950, because it has two markings on the back. The green marking, B in Compagnie, is for Bernardo, and that started in 1900, that mark. And the one below, El Bernardo et Compagnie, that they stopped using in the mid-1950s. Okay. So this probably sometime just before the 1950s. And it's a beautiful service. I'm very, very lucky to have found it. I know why you love these so much. I think these are Mummy's favourites. In fact, Mummy and Percy on their wedding day, they had one of these each at the wedding table. But my favourite is the original one. There's something very romantic and 18th century about it. I just I can, love it. I can it. see it. I can see it. It's very feminine. Yeah, I mean, you've got to really have both, I think. <laughs> I really wanted to show you this one. This is very sort of imperial. Yes, so this is obviously a Napoleonic design. Mm. But what I wanted to tell you about this one is that it's a really good example of why there are a lot of price differences within the plates that you see in Bernard d'Or. This sort of plate is very expensive because it has to be fired five times and it takes up to two weeks to create one plate like this. Because first you have your plate, your first firing, then you glaze it, you have your second firing, then you put the transfer of this band of colour. You have a third firing after that, and then you put another transfer which has the pattern on it, and then there is a fourth firing. And I guess with every firing, there's a chance something could go wrong. Every single time. Yeah. And then you can see it's in relief. It's not flat. You see that? Yeah. And that is because someone then, by hand, paints gold on top of the pattern to make it raised. Wow. And this is real gold. And again, these parts are added by hand, these lines. So you can imagine the work that goes into this if you consider that just an average piece of porcelain in Bernard d'Or is touched by 50 hands in the manufactory and 25% of all of them have defects and have to go either to the factory shop or be destroyed. 
you start to realise why they're so expensive. Yeah. They're really very precious. Stephanie, have you seen some of the prices of the stuff in here? I don't think it's going to be 50p a plate. Well, I don't want to worry you, but you may have to remortgage the chateau. <laughs> Oh. So, that is beautiful, isn't it? That is stunning. And a bit of gravy, anyone? Oh, yes, please, just to use the gravy boat. This is what I want to eat my food off at home. But you, I thought you'd just chosen your No, no, this is, this is an upgrade. This is like level up. The thing about this is that when you Whoa. see luxury things and you see another thing and you realise that the previous luxury thing wasn't quite luxurious enough. Yeah. And this, this is the new level for me. Is that 1,800? No, it can't be. Yeah, no, it is. That's, oh. that's actually, that's gold. How much is that? Actual gold. I'm 1,800. I'm afraid, yeah, I'm yeah. afraid to hold this. <laughs> Anyone who knows Oliver and knows how clumsy he is is actually having a panic attack right now, myself included. Just quietly, calmly, very calmly. I know, it's beautiful. Just put isn't it, it down, Oliver. Like ten of them. Pop it down. Well, so for 18,000, you can have the whole set. That's the most expensive bit of porcelain I've ever held. How much is that? Seriously, Ollie and I are having a heart Cheryl. attack. Just put the plate down. Try to feed the priest. Just, please just put it How down. much was that again? Oh Gerald, I beg you. Beg you, please. please just, it's lovely, but please just, just gently put it down. That's it. No. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to have much luck finding something for a fiver. <laughs> no, we this found is... it, Ollie. We found it for Gerald. This is it. I've got it. That's exact it. Five That's the exact hours. price that you wanted to spend. It's for somebody who's on a diet. <laughs> It's a soup bowl for somebody who doesn't eat much. <laughs> when I was researching the history of Bernard Dor, I actually made a very important discovery in this house. And that reminded me when I made the vlog on the history of Toile de Jouy, I discovered all sorts of things that were here in the chateau that I didn't know about. The same thing happened with Bernard Dor because the first Bernardo to come into the Limoges porcelain business was Leonard Bernardo. Leonard was just a simple apprentice, but he was so incredibly good at his job that he rose through the ranks of the porcelain factory where he was working very quickly. And that porcelain factory was called De Lumière et Compagnie. He did so well that he became an associate in the 1890s and in 1900 he bought the company in his own name and it became El Bernardo. And that reminded me, I thought I'd seen the name De Liniere somewhere. And oh my goodness, here it is. De Liniere et Compagnie. I've discovered that I have this part of the history of Bernardo already here. I've been trying to find out more about this company and they don't exist anymore. That's incredible, you actually had it all Already? That time. This was a gift from my parents. I think it was my 22nd or 23rd birthday present from my parents. You were destined to have a chateau, weren't you? Really? <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of many 22 year old girls who, who are Get like, excited about this. <laughs> and it's complete, it has a lot of little chips, but it is a it's complete charming, set. It? It's beautiful. And I now know that De Liniere ceased to exist in 1900, so it dates from sometime between 1863 and 1900. It's all hand painted. Beautiful. It seems gold. to be carnations, and each one is different. I love the sort of yellowy gold at the end of the leaves. Yes, and look inside each cup, there is another carnation. Gosh. Do you use this? I don't use it actually. Yeah, it's too fragile. I tend to use everything that I have and probably if I drank much coffee I would use it occasionally but I don't really drink coffee. I have been using this teapot in my bedroom recently. Some of the lovely teas that I've been sent I've been making in here. It's a perfect pot for one. It's lovely. But I do think I need a nice display cabinet one day. I am thinking that when we have the china pantry made here a little area of it should be a little museum part. Where's the china pantry? It's going to be in the maintenance room, right at the end of the kitchen corridor. You know, the, the mess at yeah. the moment. That's going to become the china pantry, and I'd like a little area with each of these historic plates so that we can tell people about them and tell them the history of them and the history of porcelain here in Limoges. So it's going to be storage, but with display at the same time. Yes, Beautiful. yes. Really nice. Bernardo is currently run by Michel Bernardo, who's written a fascinating book on his family history and on porcelain manufacturing. And he is the fifth generation of Bernardos to be in charge of the factory. And I've read a very moving story written by Michel Bernardo in his book about porcelain, which is that when his own father died, 
Horrifically, both of his parents died completely unexpectedly in a helicopter accident in Vietnam. And when he discovered that, he was obviously completely distraught. And his grandmother, who'd also lost her husband rather young, took him aside and said to him, I know that you're suffering, but follow me. And she took him into his father's study and said, you have to sit there at that chair behind the desk because however you're feeling, this is your place now. This is your responsibility. And I find that incredibly moving. He's done an amazing job. Yeah, to see the job that he's done, having this yeah. thrust upon him, it's very moving. Yeah. It's a family that have really done such a beautiful job of keeping this sense of tradition, but also infusing modernity with every new generation because they've always worked with the finest artists. And he has this tradition of knowing that his father, his great-grandfather, his great-grandfather before him, all turned to the finest artists of their generation. And nowadays, they're working with people like Jeff Koons, and in the past, Liechtenstein and Chagall, amazing artists. And that breathes life into porcelain. It's not just this traditional thing from the past that we still use occasionally to eat from today, but it has new life being breathed into it all the time. Yeah, I, I have to say I absolutely love the way that they are having the link with the artist because it just keeps it alive and obviously mm. I'm a big Chagall fan and a Picasso fan. Yeah, your face yeah. when you saw a plate by Chagall. <laughs> I know, and it was such a shame at the end because they had some really good priced Chagall plates, didn't they, in yes. the sort of second shop. And I think because the guy mentioned them on the tour, they are kind of they gone, them. which is very upsetting. I will um, look every time I go, I promise you, I will look until I find one. Isn't that beautiful? <gasps> it is beautiful. And I think we're going to see a bit more of Chagall later. Oh, that is love, beautiful. I just love the way his stuff is just so, so floaty, isn't it? It's amazing. That's he, the sort of plate you should be eating off, Oliver. Not your chipped white porcelain. No, Chagall plate. I love this. This is so joyful and colourful. I just love his, his, his drawing style. It's so free and it's like everything is just floating. And sometimes when people do that, it doesn't work. But for some reason, he just manages to make everything kind of gel together. It's just so joyous, isn't it? It's joyous. That's exactly it. Love it. So, I want to go look at the ones in the shop. Can we do that? Yeah, let's go and see. That reminds me of Picasso. Is there some sort of connection? Um, well, they were mates. Chagall had always wanted to meet Picasso. I think he tried in like 1910 or something to get an introduction, didn't work out. And then he got uh, an introduction just before the end of the war. Mm. They became friends for 20 years. 20 years? Like I know, us. I know, but then they had a fallout, which of course we'll never Not do. Like us. So I think it was over dinner in 1964. So why? What did they fall out about? Picasso asked Chagall when he was going back to Russia, um, and Chagall took a bit of offence um, and said, you should go, because I think Picasso had his sort of communist tendencies. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Picasso said to Chagall, um, you would only go if there was money in it. So implying that he wasn't in it for the art, he was only in it for the money, which oh, obviously is massively offensive to any artist. Oh. And particularly though, they're quite highly strung, I think, and they yes. fell out and they never spoke again. Um, over that? I know. Over a throwaway comment? It's so upsetting, over dinner and a few glasses of wine, and that was the end of a 20 year friendship. Oh no. So really sad. But I did find this, which is his glass, isn't that amazing? Just sort of pops with colour, absolutely lovely. Absolutely gorgeous. I like this one, it's kind of got the couple in the mirror. Oh yes! It's just, his, his brushwork is just so loose and lovely, isn't it? It's so simple and so expressive. Yeah. I think this is the, uh, the perfect Valentine's Day gift, by the way. So, because when you lift this, you get a surprise look. Do you think it's a pretty kind of teacup or coffee cup? And then you open this oh. and it's a symbol of love. Isn't that beautiful? I love it. Bernardo's history of working with great contemporary artists dates right back to the Art Deco period when they won several gold medals for their designs. This one is by René Crevel and it was for the International Exhibition of Decorative Arts in Paris 1925. It's so beautiful and the scale is extraordinary. They are huge. Bernardo continued the tradition of working with extraordinary artists and I love this section because this is the work of Jeff Koons and this was very, very hard for them to create. Together, Jeff Koons and Bernardo had to work to find a way to make porcelain look like metal and in fact it took over two years of finding the right way to do this. The porcelain passes through a machine 
which pulverizes lacquer at it from every angle. So you can't see any joins at all. And the lacquer is a very, very special type of lacquer. It's an incredibly expensive and complicated process that creates works of art. It's so stunningly beautiful. And just like balloons, how is it possible? And here are those extraordinary Jeff Koons pieces in the Bernardo shop. And I would get one if I could, but at 14,040 euros, I think I'm gonna have to leave him behind. But actually, he's not the one I'm truly tempted by. I am tempted by the swan. Beautiful fuchsia pink swan. And the list of extraordinary people that Bernardo have worked with goes on and on. Here are Iris Apfel's designs for them. In the collaborations with new artists, this one with JR is fantastic because the cup is actually just a mirrored surface. So then it disappears. And look, it's not a pyramid shape when you see it there. But when you add this, it becomes the pyramid in front of the Louvre perfectly. Oh my goodness, I hadn't even noticed that. It's so gorgeous. I just thought it was Louvre, but then I can see the pyramid there. And it's just so translucent, the pyramid. It's unbelievably clever. I like this very much. The day at Bernardo was filled with beauty from start to finish, but perhaps the most magical piece I saw was one right at the end in a temporary exhibition based on porcelain in the form of food. Everything in this whole museum, my favourite thing is dining in the Orangerie, which was made only last year by the American artist Chris Anteman. And she is a great lover of all 18th century France. And she wanted to create a sort of culinary orgy as though Marie Antoinette were having a party in the gardens at Versailles. And it's filled with food and fun and laughter. And yet there's a strange innocence about it too, which reminds me a lot of my father's art. I think it's one of the most joyful, beautiful things imaginable. Well, I hope you enjoyed visiting the Bernardo factory with us, seeing the beauty of the historical patterns that they still make today, discovering all of the extraordinary artists that they work with, and finding out a little bit more about the riches of Limoges porcelain. That's everything for today, and I will see you next week. Well, not quite, week. Stephanie. Not quite. Not quite? No, no, sorry, I have to go and get something. What's happening? I've come to the chateau this time to relax after a busy time at work and I wanted to say it's been wonderful and a little bit of a thank you. I'm not going yet at the end of the week, just in case you think I'm going early, but um, I noticed that you had your little eye on this at one point. You were so sneaky, we were together collection. the whole time. I know, I know. How? I snuck away. Think about the wrapping paper. That was beautiful. <laughs> Oh, Oliver! I would say you shouldn't have, but I'm so glad you did. Thank you. That's all right. Oh, socially oh, distanced. You. <laughs> Why don't you show, show people the design? This is one of the historic collections that I didn't have an example plate from. I cannot believe you got this, Oliver. This is from a collection called Le Jardin du Roi, and it's from 1793. And each plate had a different bird on it and they were all based on the works of Buffon in his natural history. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Oliver, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't believe that. My pleasure, my pleasure. Um, add one more plate to this Let's put it collection. next to this one. Let's put it right down on that one. Very gently. Look at that. It's a beautiful match. On Oliver's favourite plate. Very nice. Oh, yes. I think ready for supper tonight. <laughs> Talking of which, I need to go and do the cooking. Oh, good point. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed discovering the riches of Limoges as much as we did. There will be a Cadeau at the Chateau vlog tomorrow night and otherwise I will see you on Tuesday for the next Chateau Diaries. Bye bye from La Lande. Thanks everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>
A huge thank you to all of our patrons at Lalande who are making this vlog possible, especially our Dauphin and Dauphine of Lalande, Alice Allen, Anna, Daniela, Dan Banda, Denise Behrens, Danelle Benakovic, Linda C. Bradley, Veronica Castillo, Donna Davis, Zoe Dork, Sakura Dennis, Laura Damare, Jackie Ellison, Nicholas W. Fairfax, Tracy Ferrari, Caroline Furster, Brenda Gibbons, Abigail Grant, Brenda Harris, Delane Holbrook, Jacqueline Holmes, Helen Jacobs, Yadel and Ether, Jimmy Kemp, David and Summer Lalande, Janet Hoff Lombard, Shannon Maitland, Meredith, Nina Messick, Robert Miller, Kathy Nori, JC Award, MP, Maureen Palmer, Tonya Renee, Yvonne and Peter Richards, RJB, Candy Robinson, Bettina Rojek, Hanny Ross, Barbara Schmelz, Sven Schreiber, Lisa Schultz, Jennifer Shanks, Nancy Simmons, Patty Suhu, Susan Stevens, Sarah Thornton, Colleen Troyer, Tomislav Leinich, Brandy Walton, Aaron Windisch, Greg Wood, Brian Woodward, David Young, and Ludovico Zordanazzo. And thank you to all of you.